anyway, so um, just to say a little bit about who I am, because some of you don't know me, um, I'm a gardener, I'm the coordinator at the Josiah Braithwaite Community Gardener, Garden and Gardener at Cecil Sharp House. I also am a permaculture and permablitz designer and I do quite a lot of teaching in um, per permaculture design and gardening. And I'm also a specialist graphics trainer as well. There you go. So I've asked most of you where you're kind of coming from. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, what I'm going to cover on this workshop, um, this workshop is really going to be looking, focusing particularly on the soil um, and what needs to happen to the soil and uh, to prepare the garden for winter. And uh, that's going to be the emphasis. Obviously, if you've got questions about particular plants and or plants you could be growing over winter, then um, there'll be plenty of time, I think, for questions at the end as well. Um, so what I'm going to be looking at is assuming that you might have vegetable beds um, uh, or, you know, and you might have uh, or beds where you've had flowers growing, annual flowers growing. So in other words, plants which are going to die down. Um, you know, I'm looking at how you're going to clear, what you're going to do when you clear those. And once they're cleared, how you're best going to support the, the soil food web. Um, and in that context, we're going to look at the benefits of mulching and what green manures are. And then uh, finally, I've got some suppliers that I think might be useful for you taking your next step on this. So um, the vegetables have all finished or the annual plants have all finished and, you know, other plants have uh, died back, leaving gaps potentially in your in your beds. So the question is, what would you do next? And so I'm just wondering what you would do next. You know, if anybody can say what their normal, if they have a normal approach or what they imagine their approach would be, um, you know, in terms of what they kind of would imagine they should do. Um, I had some wood chips uh, left over from uh, what I used for the chicken coop. And so where the plum tree is and the blackberry bush, I, I sort of put them over the soil. And I do not know whether that's a correct, the correct thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right. it, I, I, I sort of did it also to um, stop the, the weeds from growing through. Um, and it's been helping so far. So I don't know whether that's the right thing to do. Yeah, cool. No, I think that's a really, that's a really good idea. How about anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I planted all my strawberries in pots in, in, in that raised bed that I have. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but try and keep all the runners and they've been self uh, rooting even outside the bed they've gone everywhere a little bit and so I don't know whether to to keep all of those or, or get rid of some um, and a celeriac do I well do I try and plant things around them or just leave it until I've dug them up if you like um, and finally I, I, I did actually get some comfrey um, and uh, planted it so that's been growing but I don't know whether I should I've been told in the first year you you shouldn't pick the leaves but I think it's like in the winter maybe that's now that it's kind of getting cold they're, they're not going to survive anyway so what should I do with them um, use them as mulch or put them in my compost bins okay sure yeah cool palm is the plant that I didn't remember early on I thought that might be it. <laughs> suddenly, I suddenly went, oh yeah, that's probably what the plant is. Yeah. I have to swear if anybody wants them, um, they are the, the sort of Bok 14 or whatever it's called, and they are from a reputable supplier. So, but I they, they sent me a lot and they grow big. <laughs> they do, they're huge, aren't they? <laughs> you only really need one per garden at the most. Very scary, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else?
Well, um, I think the, I mean, one of the things that my dad used to say is that what you need to do, and this is not just my dad. I mean, loads of people have this kind of approach, certainly down on my allotment they do, where what what will happen is the annual vegetables will finish or their annual you know plants will finish. And then what they'll do is dig over the soil. So they'll pull out all the roots, dig over the soil and turn the soil and then leave it for the frost to reach the soil if that makes sense. So they'll, it'll often be, they'll often leave it in big lumps, particularly because we're in a kind of clay soil area. And then what my dad used to say is, oh, you need to get, let the frost get to it. So it's all, it all actually very vague, get to what? I could, he, he would never be able to tell me, but you know, he, he had this idea that there was something about the frost getting to the soil and um, acting on the soil. And um, I think that's, really interesting because actually that my approach now would be in fact entirely the opposite that I don't want the frost to get to the soil and that's because I understand the soil as being full of just this huge numbers of invisible creatures and are consisting of its own ecosystem which is busy growing and needs to keep growing through the winter and so the last thing that I want to do is then to essentially chop up the, the, that habitat into you know, lots of smaller pieces and to then expose that habitat to very cold weather like frosts and, and snow and so on, simply because that will mean that the creatures in the soil are likely to die um, and be sort of um, destroyed by that. And so I was just going to sort of talk a bit about the what the soil food web is, because this is a term that scientists have started using more recently. Um, and it refers to the ecosystem that isn't just in the soil, actually, that involves all the creatures in the soil and then all the creatures outside the soil as well. Um, and that's where there's a soil food web which essentially means that the, in order to have healthy plants, we need to have healthy creatures in the soil. The one cannot go without the other. And so the, the two are dependent on each other. And from this sort of um, graphic, what you can see is that you have plants with their roots and they are dependent, the, the plants actually receive some of their nutrients directly from the soil, but not very many. Most of the nutrients that they receive and are and kind of eat come from um, the fungi, in particular the fungi and bacteria that live around the roots of the plants. And it's those fungi and bacteria that are able to break down the soil particles into minerals that the plants can eat and digest more directly. And in return, the plants feed them. They feed the fungi and bacteria. And so with, um, uh, through, uh, they, they feed them sugars. And scientists now know that between 30 and 70% of the plant's sugars, depending on what stage of growth the plant is at, between 30 and 70% of the sugars that they produce will actually be fed to creatures outside them to these fungi and bacteria that live around their roots. And so there's a mutually beneficial relationship that develops between the plants and the fungi and bacteria. And the fungi and bacteria, of course, are part of a whole kind of web of, of life of these tiny creatures that are in the soil that are, are mostly microscopic. You know, they're so tiny that we can't see them. And because they're so tiny that we can't see them, we don't even realize that they're there. And so um, these creatures live on, are also the creatures, in addition to feeding the plants, they're also the creatures that eat the dead organic matter. Um, they're the creatures that, that eat you know, everything that dies. And so they're, they're the creatures that we rely on to avoid us having just piles and piles of human bodies and animal bodies and everything else, you know, just sort of growing um, <laughs> above the earth these creatures um, eat all, all those dead, all that dead organic matter and transform that dead organic matter into food 
both for each other and also then for plants and also then for other creatures um, that live around as well. And so it's really from them that our lives are able to continue because they are the ones who take from the dead creatures and create new life. And so they're really very, very important. And they also, not only do they do that, but they also then feed a whole heap of other creatures as well. And so the idea behind the soil food web is that if you've got plenty of those creatures, then you'll have plenty of springtails and ants and snails and worms and um, beetles and centipedes and all those other larger creatures that we can see. And if you've got plenty of those creatures, then of course you'll have plenty of all the other even larger creatures like the birds and the mammals and rodents and um, and so on. And therefore also plenty of, of food for humans. You know, so the whole sort of interrelationship between all these creatures is really important for our lives as well as for the lives of all the other creatures that live on the earth. So the idea that you know, of kind of my dad's idea, which um, is to kind of dig over the soil and then expose it, will have the effect of killing, not all by any means, but will have the effect of kind of um, setting back, if you like, this, this, these creatures in the soil, um, because they will find it hard to survive the winter um, in those, uh, in that kind of environment. So really, when we're saying how do we prepare our garden for winter, one of the first questions I think we should be asking is what does the soil food web need? So what do the creatures in the soil need? And so um, really the answer to that is that they, rather than digging the soil, that in fact, what you want to do is to cover the soil. Um, and so covering the soil with a mulch, um, growing things called green manures over the winter, um, and I've got feeding with comfrey and nettle teas and aerated compost teas. That's something that you would really prepare for in the spring and not digging the soil, you know, not digging the soil over um, to dis destroy that kind of uh, that soil food web. Now, the main one of the main things that um, will suffer from the uh, digging are the fungi. OK, and I'm just going to move back actually to this slide where you can actually see um, these strands of fungi. You know, when you see a kind of mold, and that's essentially what this is, it are these strands of white fungi that you can see growing here. And they are not as quick to grow as say bacteria. So bacteria, I think can regenerate themselves in about four hours or something, you know, it's very, very quick for them to grow the next for their next generation to emerge whereas with the fungi um these are the this is both these are all types of different fungi so here i think you could be looking at fungi that feed off the plants you can also look be looking at fungi that feed off the wood chips so they're called saprophytic fungi which particularly are particularly good at breaking down really tough um you know kind of wood chips, wood, lignin, you know, the really tough materials in plants that bacteria can't really break down. So if you're, these fungi take longer to grow their hyphae. I mean, you know, they're like, a, not similar to a plant, you know, they're not going to grow in a day. And if you dig over the soil, what happens is this whole network of fungi, which a lot of which you can't see. So they, these are strands we can see but they have extremely fine strands. I mean, you know, they're, they're unbelievably thin, uh, microscopically thin. And so those strands are likely to be disrupted, destroyed, you know, and, and therefore the whole sort of structure that a, a particular fungi will have created will essentially basically die. Um, and that obviously then, for next year will take time to recover. It won't recover straight away. And so that's one of the reasons why it's particularly important if you can avoid it, um, it's best not to dig your soil over. And in fact, you don't even need to, insofar as you're um, clearing previous 
vegetables, you can actually leave, just cut the stalks and leave the roots in the soil. And that will just provide extra organic matter for the, um, for the creatures in the soil. And again, avoid um, disrupting that. Now, obviously that's not a hard and fast rule because if, you're, if you've got potatoes or you've got beetroot or any other root vegetables, then you are going to obviously want to retrieve those from the soil. So I'm not making an absolutely hard and fast rule, but in general, I'm saying that, you know, you want to try and avoid digging the soil. Um, and then, so the first thing I'm going to look at though, are, is just to look at mulching and different ways in which you can mulch. So this is a picture actually from Forest Farm Peace Garden, um, where I think it was 2018, 2017, um, we were, mulching this is a mulch that we were doing over this soil we were digging this soil up and that's because there were a whole there was a whole heap of cooch grass so that bucket is full of cooch grass roots and um so what we were doing here was digging the soil over to remove those roots because it's very hard to grow anything else if there's cooch grass present and then um the mulch that we were putting down was wet cardboard and so this we were using the um wheelbarrows we were filling them with water and then you can see this cardboard's nicely wetted down and um and sort of you know fairly thin layers and then what we were doing was putting some manure on top as a mulch um and then into that we were then planting seeds well manure and then we also had some compost so we had a mixture of manure and compost and um this is a as a mulch, um, I've certainly, my experience is that wet cardboard is really excellent as a mulch, if it's then covered with something else. If it's not, what happens is it dries out and then blows around all over the place um, and therefore isn't very effective and also doesn't really break down very well because it gets too dry for the creatures to actually eat it. But if the cardboard is wet because you've put something else on top, it's a favorite feast for the worms. And that is particularly important because the, what it means is that the worms can, the worms will come from deeper in the soil. They'll be uh, insulated over winter because of the layer of cardboard and then on top either compost or manure or wood chip or combinations of those. And um, it means that the worms are much more active, can be much more active on warmer days in, in winter. And they are particularly important because they aerate the soil, they create the air passageways, which are also crucial for the soil food web creatures as well. Um, so um, I'll just answer your question, Kat, when I get you was uh, in, just in a minute. Okay. Um, so the um the mulching is uh really important for two reasons first of all that it will it will insulate the soil and therefore protect the creatures in the soil from the kind of um, ravages of the frozen cold weather um that you get during winter but it will also then provide food for the creatures in the soil um over winter so that they have um, have food to live on basically and that's really important because what that means that's a kind of first stage in kind of providing food um, provi providing for the creatures in the soil over winter so then the other thing that I would also recommend myself is that on top of that mulch what we did here at Forest Farm Peace Garden was then we planted what are known as green manures and these are plants that you put in, which are generally going to be short lived plants where um, farmers have typically used them. I'm going to say quite a bit more about them shortly, but it basically means that over winter you have, in fact, got plants living in the soil. And um, so these this was the following spring where we they um, uh, we had another perma blitz and were basically taking the um, grass and incorporating that into the soil for the soil to eat. So Katz asked, would you leave any spent veg or flower roots in the soil, e.g. tomato plants, nasturtiums, and cut the stalks or pull them all up? 
I think it's up to you, but leaving the stalks in um, is, I think is, is good for the creatures in the soil because they'll just, you know, chomp them up over, over winter. Um, and it means that you've got less soil disturbance as well. I mean, I might decide that if they're really chunky um, roots, you know, so I know that I've had chard before, which has sort of grown this great clumping root, um, which is also quite woody. Um, and if I had something like that, which is quite woody and therefore probably won't break down over winter, I might still leave it in over winter and then chop it up into the compost heap or chop it up as a mulch um, in the spring. Um, but I might also take it out. As I say, it's not absolutely hard and fast, but generally speaking, uh, leaving the root systems in the soil can be beneficial for the, for the soil creatures. So at this stage, has anybody got any questions about what I've covered so far? And the next thing I'm going to talk about in quite a lot of detail are the green manures. I mean, I was just going to mention your wood chipping, Claudia, of the apricot and the plum trees. And just to say that that wood chip is a very good, is generally a very good mulch. Um, I think the and was was it wood chip that you'd taken from the chicken run? Um, no, it was a wood chip I bought for the chicken run, and um, but the chickens didn't really like it too much, so I used the rest to to cover up. Um, actually, I have a question. I uh, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, I have a question with uh, regards to the sage. The sage is still sort of looking like a proper plant is it going to be do I have to cut it down uh, before winter and then cover it or should I just leave it or will it freeze that's a very good question because I uh, I mean I haven't really talked about um perennial plants so plants that will come back next year mm. which obviously is a completely different ball game to annual vegetables so um, apart from the annual vegetables or annual plants, you know, plants that basically are going to have died down or be dying down over winter. Um, obviously, then you've got two other, I suppose, two or three other types of perennial plants, i.e. plants that will then return next year. So the first type of perennial are what are known as herbaceous perennial. And those are plants where the top part of the plant completely dies back. And so the, the stalks are all dead and it looks as though the plant therefore is dead. But what you'll see in spring are the new shoots and then the whole plant will regrow next year. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are herbaceous perennials. And then you have plants called shrubs. And those are plants where they're generally, at any rate, if they're deciduous, their leaves will die back. Um, but they're they're sort of they're, unlike trees they don't have a trunk so they just have this kind of bushy um, structure of twigs and branches those will stay those will remain in place and then the next year from those twigs and branches a whole heap of new leaves and blossom and so on will then start growing and then of course you have trees and if they're deciduous trees then they'll drop their leaves in autumn and look as though they're dead and then come back to life um, in spring. So all those three types of plants essentially become dormant over winter or relatively dormant over winter. And so the sage is essentially a shrub. So what you would do is you can cut back the kind of top growth. Um, so you can cut back the sage down to where the new growth is if you want to. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you wouldn't cut it into wood that does, doesn't at this point have any leaves, any mm -hmm. you know, live leaves. And that's because sage isn't very good at growing from uh, wood, you know, old wood as it's known, you know, wood that hasn't got any leaves anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite good at sprouting out from wood where you've still got some um, leaves that are still a going concern kind of thing so you can do that if you want to trim it because the sage can grow really you know 
quite uh, substantially, should we say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you can do that and that will then reinvigorate it or should reinvigorate it for next year. They, you know, they're a bit variable sages. So then, and they're not that long lived in my experience either. So, you know, sometimes you'll do that and then they'll go, oh, I can't cope with this. And, and then they've had it kind of thing. But generally speaking, that should give it a good, a, good, a new kind of reinvigorate it. Um, Kat says, I've managed to kill several sages. <laughs> well, they're, they're quite, some of them are quite fussy, actually, I find, you know, I'll put in a sage and it, I think it, it, it likes a lot of sun and it likes it quite dry. That's my experience. If it's, yeah, a, bit, think, hmm. if it's a bit soggy, then forget it. It's a sogginess, I think it's causing mm. that. Yeah. 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 And because if you're in a clay soil, you don't necessarily realise how soggy it is over winter as well. Mm. But, but you're hot, they don't grow as big. I, I've noticed no. they, you need no. to plant them up, pot them up every time to make them bigger. Yeah. But Claudia, yours is yours is in the herb spiral, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, so I grew them from seed and oh, right. I planted them in the herb spiral. And I actually had to remove two of the bushes because they overgrew yeah. so much. Because yeah. the herb spiral has is is in a perfect place for a lot of sun. Yeah. And so yeah. So I'm just gonna cut it down a bit. Um, yeah. And that's it. Harvest it. Yes. Yes. And dry the leaves and then you can distribute them maybe or use them over winter. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So then that also means that things like comfrey, for example, will die down, as um, you were saying, Kat. You can see that the leaves are already dying down. And yes, put them on the compost heap, putting them down as a mulch. So either of those would work really well. I mean, for example, um, comfrey has these big green leaves and you could put them underneath some cardboard and put some cardboard then on top and then put some um, compost on top of that or you could put the cardboard down then the comfrey then the compost either way that would all be really good for the soil and Claudia it'd be really beneficial for the plum tree and the apricot tree to take the leaves that are left from your comfrey and put them around the base of those trees like if you can move the wood chip back put the comfrey mm -hmm. down then put the wood chip on top i do that thanks that's great because i knew that comfrey was really good but i didn't know for what <laughs> <laughs> or how to use it so or how to use it, it. Thank yeah you. yeah Thank yeah. You. yeah sure um so definitely do that i think the one thing that i would say about um wood chip is that it's uh it's got a lot of wood wood in it obviously because it's wood chip so it's actually different to bark chip so bark chip um is not in order for bark chip to break down it's really much more dependent on fungal activity and the fungi you know it's it's like so tough that really only fungi can have any impact on it. Whereas with wood chip, uh, the bacteria can have some impact on it and will start eating some of the wood chip. But in order to do that, they'll need nitrogen as well. And so one of the things that people say can happen, and there's a lot of debate about this, but one of the things um, that you, I think is quite useful to be aware of is that um, if you're going to put down wood chip, that I would add some kind of nitrogen as well. So that could be um, something like mixing it with some grass clippings, or you see here that you've got a whole load of grass that was grown as a green manure, which I'm going to cover in a minute. And so that would also then be a way of benefiting it. Or you could mix your urine in with some. So if you dilute your urine by about 10, 20 times, and pour that around the on top of the wood chip that would then provide a really good balance of nitrogen potassium and um, phosphorus particularly brilliant for fruit trees um, so it's worth bearing bearing that in mind i mean claudia that's one thing that um, you and ashen could do is is you know just take i think each tree needs about a one p a year one you know, one sort of lot of pea a year. So you could do that where this, you know, you just take one of your peas, put it in a 
it sounds funny, doesn't it? One of your peas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you go to the loo and do a pee, you put that into a watering can and then dilute it by about, you know, fill the watering can up, basically, it should do it easily, and then mm -hmm. just pour that round each of the trees. Um, so that's a very good way of, you know, one way of adding nitrogen to, um, to wood chip and also a very good way of fertilising fruit trees. Excellent. Thank you so much. Cool. Any other questions before I move on to green manures? Has anybody got any other? Yes, I have. Yes. Um, I'm not too sure whether I should be asking now or holding my, you know, questions uh, oh, at the very right. end. Yeah. Um, as I said, um, you know, this um, allotment is overgrown, um, and the diameter, if I explain it, is like as as big as your your little finger. Um, I'm not too sure what. You know, um, you know uh, what plants are those, but they're all tiny. I, I I did go a couple of times, and I said, you know, whether did I do a right decision of choosing this particular plot? But then it's it's a challenge which which I'm which I'm gonna you know, um, not shy away from. So um, as I understand from the discussion, is there are two school of thoughts. One is the dig method, and one is the no dig method. So if I say the if I use the no dig method, then first of all, uh, I would have to use um, a grass, um, you know, cut or whatever to cut off the, the, the growth, which is above the ground and just leave it and cover it with um, cardboard, wet cardboard. But the question here is I would need copious amounts of cardboard and I'm not too sure whether, you know, whether I'll be able to do that. You know, so is there any other alternative uh, of uh, using the, um, uh, the cardboard because in my garden clearly I can I can use the cardboard that I've got you know from our house move so that's not a problem but for the allotment I'll have to um, you know do some radical thinking. Yes so I think your first step would be to find out what the plants are um, because on um, an allotment the, the main question you've got to answer is are the plants annual plants i.e they're going to die at the end of this year or are they plants that are going to come back? And the, there are some plants which are very, very tenacious. And generally, and in lots of ways, they're fantastic plants, but not if you're planning on growing anything else in that area. So for example, things like bramble, I'm imagining you would know if it was bramble because it would be thorny. So I'm guessing you haven't got bramble on there. Uh, I think I do have, I mean, I'm not too sure. Um, you know, because I'm still a mature learning uh, because sure. we moved to this country, what, I mean, just two years ago. So um, I'm yet to learn, you know, the different types of, um, you know, the Dance. weeds and all of, yeah. of those good things. So, yeah. So which means um, I, I, I would have to cut it off and, um, and let them, I mean, sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. Go on. Sorry. Well, I mean, that, that would be your first step, is to find out what kind of plants they are. Now, insofar as you're learning, one of the things you might find really useful is to join the Royal Horticultural Society. So their membership costs about £55 a year, £57, I can't remember exactly how much, but they have a, um, an advice service where you can take pictures of the plants, any plants, and or pictures of anything you've got questions about in relationship to plants and send them off to this advice, you know, this advice uh, service and they will give you, they will tell you what the plants are. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that could be really useful for you if you're not familiar with the plants and you've only, you know, and you've got a garden and an allotment that you're trying to kind of now cultivate. So that, that's one suggestion. It's not the only one by any means, because the other thing you can also do is ask people on the allotment. So mm -hmm. if it's anything like all the other, all the allotments that I've ever been on, <laughs> you have plenty of very, very opinionated people and people who are really keen to help, you know, which is great. And so I think you can probably, if you can see anybody else on the allotment, they'll tell you what the plants are in all likelihood. And the plants that you're particularly going to need a different um, approach to, I would say, are things like bindweed, cooch grass, 
uh, bramble, uh, mare's tail or horse tail, um, and grand elder in particular. So those plants will not respond. I mean, well, they will respond to you covering it with cardboard, covering your plot with cardboard and, um, you know, mulch of, you know, compost or something like that. But all that will happen is they'll become lots, much more vigorous come the spring. And so yes. um, that's why I'm saying you need to find out which the plants are, because if you have got something like, if they are, if, if you've got bindweed or cooch grass or any of those growing there, in all likelihood, I think you would need to do what uh, we did here, which was to dig out all the cooch grass that you can find and all of those roots. Um, because what they tend to do is they tend to form um, mats of roots, you know, so that they're very effective in covering the ground. And so from the point of view of, if you like the soil food web, from the point of view of the natural world, they're ideal. They're extremely vigorous, very, very strong plants, and they cover the ground very quickly. Um, obviously, that's not exactly what you're after when you're trying to grow other plants, though, because yeah. they tend to take over. Um, so I think that you're, what you can do, I have seen someone who um, is doing no dig on my allotment, um, who covered the whole of his plot with black plastic so impermeable black plastic for at least a year. So he grew mm. nothing on his plot. So he's doing no dig. That's what he did in order to kill those plants. Um, now I have to say that may not even work with bindweed. Bindweed seems to be a magic plant that can grow roots without having any, you know, top growth underneath <laughs> black plastic, you know, where it's, I, I, it amazes me, absolutely amazing. But that would be my um, my advice is that the first thing would be to find out which plants you've got growing and then decide what you want to do about that. If they've got um, stems about the thickness of your little finger, it does imply to me that you probably have got, you might well have annual plants, like which might be even something like fat hen, which is actually edible. Um, so yeah, that, and if that's the case, then I probably would, you know, if you've got lots of them, I'd probably just pull out the plants and then, um, you know, eat them, give them to chickens if you've got any, and then, and then mulch after that. What I was also contemplating was, uh, you know, uh, before hearing this Nordic method was to, you know, uh, hire a dealer and then just till the soil so that, you know, I, I get rid of everything in the first year and then employ the no dig method in the subsequent years? Definitely, that, that is what I'm kind of suggesting. But if you hire a digger, um, I don't think the allotment would let you, most allotments wouldn't, but I think you'd be, um, you would uh, end up compacting the soil, which would then destroy the soil food web as well and, and be much harder, a lot of work to then dig over and re-aerate re re the soil. Another, another thing that people suggest is a rotivator. Um, that's actually going to compound, make the problem much worse, unfortunately, because the thing about bindweed and cooch grass and all the plants that I've just mentioned um, is that they can grow a new plant from a, an inch long piece of root. And so if you've got a rotivator, which is one which is kind of a mechanical digger, but on you yeah. know a portable one, um, it will simply chop up the roots. And so although the soil looks lovely, you'll then find that you've actually multiplied the number of plants that you've got in, in the soil that will then grow, if you see what I mean. Right. I was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking of using that same thing because I've got one. I've just borrowed one from my, from my friend, uh, electric um, rotivator. Yeah. So I've I've used it in my garden, but then one small section I've I've used it, but it's 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 fantastic. I mean, the amount of work that you can do and achieve, you know, in half an hour's time is like, you know, a couple of hours if you take a spade and do it. Yep, absolutely. That's very yeah. true. And if you know, I think that um, it's definitely something to consider because there's a question of how on earth are you actually going to make a productive space when it's just you know for most plots for most allotments they're imagining that you're going to have a lot more time than yeah, you really so. have 
I think the only thing that I would say is, first of all, find out what the plants are, because if you apply the rotavator, you could actually be making your problem way worse. And by the spring, mm. although it'll look lovely now, by the spring, you'll just find there's no space, space to grow anything because those plants have been chopped up and are now emerging yeah, as, yeah. you know, kind of multiple plants. Yeah. So, okay, um, so I am going to move on to talk about green manures um, and green manures kind of a strange name in some ways, I guess, but the idea behind them is that instead of using poo and pea mixed up with, you know, whatever bedding you've got for animals, um, you, it, they're basically plants that are grown to cover and protect the soil. And it's not just in winter, actually, but um, at all times of the year, because they the idea is that, well, there are two ideas. Um, the original idea behind green manures is that they draw nutrients that exist in the soil into their leaves. And then what happens is they're actually cut down and chopped up and incorporated into the soil. And those nutrients are therefore returned to the soil. Now, originally, green manures were really, they're the same idea as the lay plants for fields. So when you had um, the, the farming system used to be the case, and still is in, in lots, in many cases, where you'd grow a crop like uh, wheat, for example, and then you would leave the field to lay, as it's known. I'd really be interested to know where that word kind of comes from, actually. Um, but basically what you would do is that because you would the farmers understood that the soil needed to recover and replenish after growing a crop a single crop of very nutrient demanding plants like wheat um, what they would then do is to plant something else um, that would plant put in another plant that would allow the soil to recover and so they would for example in the Near East, you know, in, in kind of, um, they would, I mean, even this a very long time ago, they would alternate cereals and legumes. Legumes are beans um, and peas, you know, those kinds of plants. Um, and so there's a very, very strong tradition of uh, doing that, you know, of actually understanding that the soil needed time um, to recover. And so a kind of three year rotation, which was very common was to grow grasses, i.e. wheat, barley, rye, you know, crops, and then legumes, and then leave the leave the field to go fallow to allow whatever plants were there to grow. Um, and you know, you can see why that would have been that was really important to provide on a farm. You would always have fields that were in fat, you know, were fallow, and they would be growing any number of different wildflowers uh, that would then provide forage for insects, which would then provide food for birds. And you can start to see how it's come about that we now um, have such a decline in all those creatures. Um, the grasses and legumes give a crop for, for humans and, um, and then they, when it's fallow, obviously they could graze the livestock on the fields. But now, um, since the Second World War, um, the farmers no longer need to, or they think they don't any longer need to leave a land, a field fallow. And that's because uh, they replace that process with um, fertilizer that's been derived from oil that they basically, they add, that means that they can keep growing nitrogen demanding plants like the wheat year after year after year and basically they just constantly put on more and more fertilizer and um, the common agricultural policy doesn't require farmers to leave any land fallow anymore and you can start to imagine the impact that that has above ground because what it means is you no longer have that diversity of plants growing on a farm where one year you would leave, you would have inevitably a huge diversity of seeds in the soil, which would then grow and fill the fields with any number of different 
um, huge numbers of different uh, wildflowers and um, that that seed bank that would exist within the soil, we've lost that basically on most, you know, on most farms now, those, those seeds have, have gone, especially because then this whole sort of um, approach is accompanied by uh, herbicides as well as pesticides. Below the soil, the consequences are also extremely um, serious because the creatures in the soil that I've described rely are killed by the fertilizer. So the fertilizer that they're using that's derived from oil is a salt-based chemical fertilizer. It's one where the nitrogen that the plants need in order to grow and you know create their green leaves and photosynthesize, that nitrogen is in a, the form of a chemical salt, um, which is a, in a form that the plants can absorb it directly. So it means that the plants aren't dependent on the bacteria and fungi in the soil to provide them with that nitrogen. Um, and at the same time means that then those creatures in the soil are killed by the salts. They can't survive that, the impact of that, um, those chemical salts. And so basically what it means is you've got, um, a uh, an ongoing situation where the, the soil is becoming more and more depleted and run down and um, at the same time it, the farmers are becoming more and more dependent on the fertilizer and at the same time you've got more and more fertilizer runoff from the fields that's then impacting all our waterways which is then you know of course could say ironically um, then impacting our health as well, because our waterways are becoming polluted and therefore the water that we drink is becoming more and more polluted essentially. And so it is the case that more farmers now are starting to look at alternative ways of maintaining their soil health and maintaining the fertility for their crops. And so obviously we're not farmers on that scale, but I think it's quite useful to consider their approach to growing um, in plants which require intensive um, nutrients, you know, they require a lot of nutrients. And uh, essentially what we're doing, if we're growing vegetables in particular, is that we're doing that, but on a smaller scale. And so it's um, quite possible that if you've grown your vegetables and then you dig over the soil, that actually then you're going to be reliant on fertilizer you know, if you're going to take that approach that you are likely could be reliant on fertilizer for the following year and get into that kind of cycle. So green manures are essentially a way of um, leaving some land to lay in a way. And um, what's fantastic about them is that where you've got some space, some soil where you haven't got any vegetables growing as now, for example, at this particular time of year, maybe somewhere where you were growing potatoes or corn and beans and squash, tomatoes and so on, you can plant some green manures that will grow and cover the soil. So they'll both insulate the soil by, you know, through being the, um, the plants there, but they will also, um, as well as insulating the soil, and therefore protecting the soil life, they will also then provide food for that soil life. So if you remember back to the slide where I was explaining about the soil food web, soil food web is dependent on the plants being there because they feed off the, the plants feed the fungi and bacteria and vice versa. And so that's also, it means that therefore that whole ecology in the soil will continue to be supported by the plants that you are growing over the winter. And what you do with those plants is generally you would then cut them down and you, know, you can kind of um, return them to the, the nutrients to the soil. So in other words, then um, the plants, the green manure is essentially playing the same role that the natural naturally would happen because you know that when you leave soil bare, nature quickly covers the soil with plants. It's not like you have, 
soil that's then completely bare ongoingly. It's very, very rare for that and only happens where you've got a really poisonous soil, essentially. Um, and so the idea for life to continue the whole time is, is to have plants there. And so the green manures are our way of introducing plants that will fill that, fulfill that role and continue the ecosystem. So um, I was gonna go through some different green manures that you can use. Um, and generally speaking, you have plants which will grow in winter and then plants that will grow um, in summer, kind of spring, summer, autumn. And really they divide up into plants that you can grow, plants that will survive over winter um, and generally not be killed off. And that will also include some plants which you can plant now and which will germinate now um, and grow slowly over the next few months. Um, and then you've got the kind of summer, the spring, summer, autumn green manures. And those are plants which will um, really germinate come sort of March time, March, April, May time, depending on the plant. They'll grow very, very fast um, over summer, you know, over spring, summer, and then autumn. And so those are green manures which you can plant really at any time um, up until September, October time um, to fill an area and some of these will grow in a matter of weeks um, so I was just going to go through and just talk about some of the plants um, individually so Phacelia which is one of my favorite green manure plants because it's it's actually I don't really know why people don't grow this as an ornamental plant because it's so beautiful um, you can see these lovely purple flowers that kind of grow in spirals um, and you can, it has this very uh, soft, feathery foliage, grows extremely quickly. And because it's so sappy and soft, it means that it's very quick to break down into the soil. And normally what you would do is, is cut that down before the plant has flowered. Um, and that the idea behind that is really because when a plant flowers, all of its nutrients and resources go into the, you know, not all, but a lot of the nutrients and resources from the plant's body go into the flowering process. And what you're really wanting to do with green manures is to catch the um, nutrients in the plant's bodies, their leaves, in other words, and stems before they've got to the point of flowering. Um, as you can tell, I almost always leave some phacelia to, to flower though. Um, then you've got buckwheat, which is a similar, similar actually, it's, it's an edible plant. Um, well, as you probably know, because, uh, you know, we've been eating buckwheat as humans for many years. Um, and uh, that mainly is a grain, but you can also, I believe you can also eat the leaves as well. Again, a very fast growing plant. And just like Celia, which I forgot to mention about Celia, the bees love the flowers. Um, and actually you can get different varieties. I found um, some beautiful pink flowered varieties in, Amer in America that are uh, kind of self seeded themselves on my allotment now. Um, but again, it grows a massive green um, vegetation, which you can then chop down and chop back in. Alfalfa is, um, is grown a lot actually by farmers as a um, food for livestock and an amazing plant. I mean, obviously we eat it as alfalfa shoots um, or some people eat it as alfalfa shoots. It has a very, very deep root. So it it's, um, has roots that will grow very deep into the soil. And for that reason, they're very useful if you've got a, a strongly clay soil and you need to kind of break the soil, not break the soil up exactly, but to create um, aeration channels, if you like, channels where the air can get into the soil. So it's very useful from that point of view. It does sometimes also act as what might be called a nitrogen fixer. Hang on a minute, I think I've got someone who's trying to get in, no? Um, and uh, then um, that basically means that an 
a nitrogen fixer is a plant which forms a relationship with bacteria that knows how to change, take the nitrogen from the air and change the nitrogen into a form that plants can eat. However, alfalfa, although it is a nitrogen fixer, doesn't, um, doesn't fix nitrogen particularly effectively in this climate, um, which is not to say I would, you know, I would still use this as a plant because it's, uh, as I say, has, its, has these real benefits. You can see lots of green growth very good root system. Then you've got different clovers. Um, and these are, a lot of these are really pretty, you know, have other uses, herbal use, you can use them as a tea. Um, fantastic for bees. These do fix nitrogen. Um, and so that they're also a beneficial plant from that point of view as well. Mostly low growing and um, so they, provide a very effective ground cover. Um, and the white clover, whoops, sorry, the white clover and the um, red clover are perennial. Um, so they'll come back again and again. And so this is a kind of green manure, um, which you can also use as just an ongoing ground cover um, to cover the ground and uh, also fix nitrogen. So I often use clover um, around the base of fruit trees. For instance, one of the white or the red clover around the base of fruit trees. And when that grows up in spring, just chop the leaves up uh, and that will provide um, the trees with a, a boost of nitrogen and the plants will then just grow up again. Um, so it's very useful as a nitrogen fixing plant. Also could grow it around the base of um, corn, you know, any other, other plants that need a good boost of nitrogen as well. Lupins, I've not, I don't think I've ever grown lupins, but I mean, again, a, a great green manure for a mass of green growth, pretty flowers, um, good for bees, and they will also fix nitrogen as well. So these are nitrogen fixers. Radish grows very deep tap roots um, and a mass of green growth. So again, beneficial from that point of view. Fenugreek, um, which is, you can eat, obviously, <laughs> very fast growing. Um, and so you could harvest some and chop the rest up into the soil. Um, so those are all green manures that you would plant. For example, you could plant them in March and cut them down in early May. So if you've got a bed where you've got some chard at the moment or some kale, and that finishes, it say in, in March, you could then put in some green manures um, that you could cut down in cut down in early May, dig into the soil, and then plant out your summer veg, like your courgettes, the corn, the squash, the beans, and so on. You can, however, also intercrop, they call it, with green manures. So, in other words, if you had a um, some rows of beetroot and then maybe um, a row of, uh, now my mind's gone blank, leeks or something like that. You could actually then between the two rows, you could plant maybe some phacelia. And with the phacelia, you might cut down every other plant and create a, chop it up and, and leave it as a mulch and leave the remaining plants to flower to attract the, you know, attract the uh, pollinators. So, you can be very, in my view, my view, you can be very flexible with how you use these plants um, and kind of experiment and be creative and, and so on. And you can also mix them together to create a, a diversity of plants that you're putting in um, to cover the soil. So when you get to the winter plants, field beans is one of my favorite green manures to grow over winter. And this is um, a really good example, actually, of something completely unrelated. Well, I'm not sure that it is completely unrelated, actually, um, but it's to do with the prejudices that uh, people, cultures, I suppose you could say, or you know, certain certain cultures you could say have about certain plants. So in Britain, um, field beans are regarded as a lay crop you know in other words one you would you would plant in the fields and then you would just chop down you might feed it to the animals you know you might feed the beans to the animals but that's it um and 
people would never dream of eating the beans that they produce. It produces, you know, it's like a kind of variety of broad bean, but instead of producing those big fat beans that broad beans do, they're kind of neat little um, beans, otherwise known as fava beans. And um, they are the bean actually that's used to create full madame in Egypt, which is the breakfast that most people eat. So um, that's a kind of aside really about field beans. Um, so in other words, they are a food crop. So it's worth, you know, just to be aware of that. But they are also a nitrogen fixer. So this image here, can you see these little tiny nodules that are growing along the roots? These nodules um, fix uh, other, other colonies of bacteria that are growing into the roots of the plant and with the plant. And so the bacteria are as attached to the roots of these field bean plants as the bacteria that grow in our guts are as, a, you know, they're as a, attached in the same way to us. And um, so what makes them very useful is that then they will essentially boost the amount of nitrogen that you have in the soil both through the action of this, these bacteria. And if you cut them down and dig them in before they flowered, that will give a big boost of nitrogen to the soil for your following crops. Obviously you can also, if you want to leave some of them to flower and, you know, and then eat them because they're good to eat. Then you've got um, a variety of different grasses and the good, uh, the benefit of planting grasses to cover your soil over winter is that they create a massive green um, matter. And they're also, they will germinate and grow in colder weather. And um, they'll cover the soil, they have good deep roots and um, they will protect and uh, incorporate a lot of the nutrients from the soil into their leaves over winter. And then you dig them back in. This is a, another alternative, which is uh, black oats. And then you have this uh, winter tares or vetches. Now they would have to be planted before now. They would have had to have been planted really August, September because they need the warmer weather to germinate, um, but they would survive over winter. And what's great about it is if any of these, of the plants do die back, they simply then are incorporated into the soil. Um, so uh, they are, they're really um, useful as well. So um, the idea is to plant green manures in September, October, November to overwinter. And you could plant a mixture of different green manures. You know, you could do rows of ryegrass or just a mixture of ryegrass and field beans and then cut them down and dig them in around March time. And um, by combining the uh, field beans and ryegrass, for example, you would, you know, give a good boost of nitrogen. Um, and so we were doing something similar um, just recently. You might recognize someone in this photograph. Um, and we were basically, we were um, cutting down with planted green manures. This was, uh, this is a garden at uh, Battersea Art Centre, um, which we are now starting to plant up in planters. And you can see the clover growing here. So we were um, digging up the, actually digging up the clover and then chopping it up, the whole, the roots and everything, chopping that up and then reincorporating into the soil before we planted bulbs and some um, other plants for, um, in the planters. And so that's become a way of introducing and boosting the um, soil food web in the planters here. Um, so, yeah, I think the main thing I would say is that just to remember that you can leave some of the green manures to flower and uh, you can get crops from some of the green manures um, and you can also collect seeds from some of your green manures to then use for the next, next year. And I finally going to just give you some um, suppliers. So these are companies, seed companies, which sell green manures. Uh, Tamar Organics are a small family company. 
um, they've got you know they've got organic green manure seeds. The organic catalogue used to have a really fantastic range. It's it's not as good as it used to be, but it's still a good place to get organic um, organic green manure seeds. And greenmanure.co.uk that's about the only place I've found at the moment to get field beans. They're not organic, but they are nonetheless a source of field beans. And I found there's very few of those around and available. So here endeth my yakti yakti yakting. And I can see that uh, people have got um, um, some questions. So uh, I'll just try. And uh, so Kat has said, also try Google Lens for some plants that have clear leaves flowers. Oh, okay, What's, what was that in relationship to Kat? It was, uh, I think, a question from Kenneth or the issue of Kenneth not knowing some of the right. uh, plants that may grow. I mean, I use Google Lens for when I see right. a shrub or something or a flower that I like. Yeah. Often, um, you need to be careful because it might suggest something that isn't the right plant. Yeah. It, it often does, um, uh, yeah, actually give you an idea of what it could be. Yeah. So for couch grass, it's not going to work because it, it I think uh, there's too many that look like that. Yeah. But maybe for Phycelia or for, well, um, uh, you know, black blackberries, what do you call them? The brambles yeah the brambles i think yes that would help yeah sure absolutely cool if you could just uh, show us the the last slide please i, I just want to yeah oh in. yes sure sorry thanks um there you go shall i take a screenshot and put it in the chat i'll do that I've done that after kind of that. Anyway. that was sense <laughs> would have been sensible for you to have put that out anyway, wouldn't it? Everyone else okay with that? Yeah. Yep. Good. Yep. Cool. So any any questions after all that burbling? More burbling. Yes. I was wondering uh, if sorry, you go. Sorry, Claudia, go on. Ladies first. I, I was just uh, gonna ask Susanna if, if you could send me a list of all the of all the plants that we planted initially, so I can check by googling them <laughs> which one I still oh, have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll send that over, and then you could also send me some photos as well. Yeah, and then I can kind of point out what's what. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, oh, Kenneth sorry. Yeah. yeah, Kenneth, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, um, uh, what I was going to ask was, uh, I've got a fairly decent size garden in my backyard and also in my front yard. The front yard is all just laid to lawns and ornamental uh, plants and shrubs. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the backyard, I've got uh, three um, apple trees, uh, two pear trees, I've just planted, um, a cherry tree and a fig tree. But if you ask me the names of the, the apple trees, I'm not too sure. Um, um, one or two, seem, one perhaps seems like a, a cooking apple. Uh, the other one is a green apple. But the question is, um, how much, oh, sorry, I haven't told you the size. It's around 20 meters length by say five meters or seven meters. Okay. Um, bread. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to use the whole of my back, um, you know, backyard, back, backyard for for planting, um, you know, uh, vegetables. But for this, I mean, what what would be the ideal uh, quantity if I if I need to order, um, you know, the uh, the winter um, green uh, manures. Green manures. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, when you go to order them, they will tell you how many square meters they'll cover. You know, so if you, I think you, I, I recently placed an order with green manures, for example, and 
I know that they sell, I think, in kind of 100 grams, 250 grams, one kilogram and so on. And they'll tell you how many square meters they'll cover. And so I'd go on that basis, um, you know, and follow that. But also bear in mind that it's not going to be a problem if you've overordered because you can always use them next year. Right, thanks. And is it that I have to use all the different varieties, um, um, you know, the clovers and the, the other good names that you have said, or just one kind, um, you know, either nitrogen fixers or whatever it could be? Um, it's entirely up to you, actually. I think that um, now, if you want to plant green manures now, your best bet is to plant uh, field beans. And uh, they're actually green manures, I forgot to update my presentation, they're also selling a winter pea as well, which is a similar, has a similar effect as a nitrogen fixer, um, but it will germinate now. So that's why I'm placing a strong emphasis on field beans and these forage peas, I think they're called. Um, but they will actually germinate now. Um, so if you haven't planted any green manures yet, it's not too late to do that, um, to plant those. And you could also plant the ryegrass now. And what you can do is then chop that down in spring, leave some if you want to, to flower and, and you know, produce a crop. Um, and then it's really about, um, what do you want to plant and you can be I think you can be very flexible you know because you can kind of mix the plants um apart from the fact that you have you know you, you might want to consider alfalfa because it has very deep tap roots and very deep roots and so if you've got a very clay soil that will help to create more airways in the soil which will really benefit the um will benefit the soil food web as well as any other plants you put in. Um, apart from that, then, you know, phacelia and buckwheat will give you masses of green growth, which will give you a lot of organic matter for the soil, which again will then support the clay. You know, if you've got very clay soil, it'd be beneficial for that. Um, clover is a good nitrogen fixer. So I would usually grow clover, you know, where you've got the trunk of a tree and then I'd grow the clover around the base. Um, and I mean, it's something you could do, Claudia, is just literally sprinkle some clover seeds on top of the wood chip. Um, you wouldn't even have to remove the wood chip and that, that you know, some of those will then germinate and, and you know, give you a good nitrogen fix around the base of the fruit trees. Would you, would you, if I were to plant some field beans around the trees now and then cut them back in spring and then immediately plant the clover yeah that would be brilliant all right okay. well actually not quite when you cut them back the field beans what i'd probably do is cut them back in march and incorporate them in with the wood chip and then give them a you know maybe four weeks to break down mm -hmm. and then plant the clover and i probably just put over a sprinkling or something of compost just so the clover's got something to, to as a seed to germinate within okay if that makes sense so you want yeah. to um, the green manures, when you chop them up and put, incorporate them into the soil, then you don't, Im don't usually immediately plant seeds just because you've got all this organic matter, you've got all this kind of, all these um, leaves, bits of leaves and stalk and so on mm -hmm. in the soil or on top of the soil. So it makes it harder for the seeds to germinate there. So you leave that for a while to break down and then, you know, give it, you know, maybe four, six weeks, something like that. You, it depends on, you know, you can see. Mm -hmm. how much it's broken down and then plant your seeds and then and then the clover you said to cut then back in may could i then plant something else well i mean it's up to you i would round fruit trees i often just leave the clover cut mm -hmm. it back it'll regrow you see if okay, you good. if you plant the red the red or the white clover because it's a perennial it'll just come back and so then you're basically what you're doing is feeding the tree with a kind of um, a mulch of, of green leaves. Yeah. And, they, and you're also keeping the plant at the stage where the nitrogen fixing aspect of the plant is still, it's still going to be feeding the soil food web rather than putting all this nitrogen fixing um, energy into growing its flowers. Okay, good to know, thank you.
Kenneth, did that answer your question? Yes, yes. I've got, I've got, uh, I think, two more, uh, if I can, please. Yeah, yeah. The first thing is, um, you know, the the fallen apples and the pears. What I what I did last year was, I dug a hole all across and I and I buried them, and right. also the leaves. So would that serve as the same purpose as cutting off, say, alpha, alpha, or you know, would would that fix nitrogen? Uh, I suppose. Um, and I'm not too sure. And the second question um, was, I forgot about it. <laughs> well, shall I answer that one? And then you think whether or not you can remember the other question. So with the fallen fruit, the fruit that kind of is kind of going rotten and then all, all the leaves that you've got, did you, do you mean you kind of composted that all down? Put it in a no, I just, I just dug, I just dug, um, you know, um, 20 centimeters and, oh. you know, seven, and, and then just put um, a layer. Right underneath yeah okay well i mean i've never done that but i'm sure that that sounds like that would probably work fine um but you could also just incorporate them into a compost heap and some of them could also go into a wormery i mean they love they'll eat the the fruit and i would definitely say that if you don't have a wormery i would set one up because the soil from a wormery you know the the um poo from a wormery is about one of the strongest um fertilizing sort of sources of fertilizer that you could get so really really beneficial um so yeah that's very that's definitely something i would recommend but yeah definitely that, right. that yeah uh, that uh, thanks that triggered me um, my thought process and the second question is that you know now whatever you have said that's that's the theoretical theoretical part which i've you know which i really appreciate i've, I've got the hang of it but do you recommend seeing any videos, you know, um, web or uh, a YouTube channel? Or I've I've, I've been on the um, RHS website, but then it doesn't uh, give us that. Uh, it gives us the narrative, you know. Uh, like for example, today I went on their site to how to prune the apple trees, because I don't think you know this. The the the, the owner of the previous house has done any sort of pruning uh, mm -hmm. because it's not. It does not have that. You know, wine glass shape. It just sort of it's like a canopy, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so I I know that I've got a you know big task over the next couple of years, but um, you know nothing to be ambitious about. But I'm I'm, mm. I'm thinking of taking it you know one step at a time. Uh, and I've been um you know I've been reading about palmaculture and videos on YouTube and how. Uh, you know, some of the states within India has transformed themselves incorporating permaculture uh, practices. So, I mean, this is a fairly new thing to me. And I've also been a member of permaculture mm -hmm. and attended the two, what was it? The two, uh, sorry, uh, the one of the, two of the 10 classes, um, which was, I think, last, last month. Uh, the um, European permaculture. That's right. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that gave me a sort of a basics of understanding what permaculture is. But yeah, I mean, I'm a sort of, you know, I, I want to get my, um, uh, you know, uh, spare time in, into this, whether my wife or my children supports me or not, but I'll definitely they will do. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, yeah. one, one thing that I would suggest, I mean, because you're right, it, it all becomes, you know, you, you look at things on a computer and you hear about the ideas and all the rest of it. And um, one of the things that we've found, and this is why this workshop is actually, is the idea is that it's combined with a session in the garden at the mm -hmm. Josiah Braithwaite Community Garden to plant the green manures, to clear, you know, to do that, do precisely what I'm talking about now in the yeah. garden. Now, um, but the, we, we do that as, um, cause I'm, part of Permablitz London as well. And so if you um, if you want to learn more about these processes, then I would suggest you, um, you know, what, might want to join the Permablitz London mailing list and consider coming to, for example, the Perma, Permablitz at Forest Farm Peace Garden. Permablitz is a basically um, days where people get together to transform a garden or to work on a garden in a way where there's a lot of skill sharing and a lot of practical work 
which then involves kind of um, people developing their understanding of what they're doing and the space at the same time as doing it. And so there we will be planting green manures, we will be preparing the soil for winter, there'll be um, a chance to look at a lot of the forest garden plants that are there as well, um, and we'll be doing using some of the prunings from the plants to create natural dyes as well. So that would be one way in which you could then combine what you're learning theoretically, uh, practically. So I'm only suggesting that because I think you're in because you're in Bexley to come all the way over to West London is you know quite a trek and so the forest farm peace gardens i know it's still in east london but actually from bexley i don't know that it's that much of a i think that um probably isn't such a big journey i don't know but that's an i did yeah i did i did look into it but um yes it's um i have to i have to travel a bit yeah mm. and also just so you know whichever garden you come to your wife and your kids would be very welcome indeed well thanks thanks so i mean yeah just, and if yeah. your wife wants a day off bring your kids you know what i mean <laughs> so, <laughs> but they're, yeah. they're they're very um all our events are very much organized around being child friendly and and we'd love to have kids coming along so um you know uh yeah just to say that really so um the yeah has anybody got any other final questions because looking at the time we've already made it to we're nearly there uh, yeah. quick I, I don't have a question but i just googled field beans and i saw that on sowseeds.co.uk you can find field beans and you get 20 percent off your first order whoa excellent cool. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much for everything that's all right. Any, uh, Kat, did you have any final questions? Just a quick one, because I planted some basilia, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, um, no, that's them. And then I planted a bit more before I left in uh, whatever, August. And it's still green, it's still there. So, and also with a, a borage plant that came up from seed, I think. Mm -hmm. Should I leave them there for now? Or in fact, yeah. indeed plant some um, field beans in expectation of them dying anyway over the winter. Yeah, I mean, in the gaps, you can put in some field beans because the field beans, you know, they're not tiny seeds. So you just create a hole and put pop some beans in. So okay, yeah. Good idea. yeah, add them yeah. up to, to yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 So and you're coming to the garden, aren't you? Yeah, I will yeah. do. Yeah. Will. So you can collect some field beans from the garden. I love the idea that they're fava beans. That's brilliant, actually. I never knew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Great. OK, well, um, I, I want to say thank you to you all for coming. And I'm hoping tonight's session has been useful. And um, hopefully I shall see you somewhere face to face soon at some point. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank, thank you, so everybody. Much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Bye.